So we've had a couple of talks this morning about Android and privacy and malware. And we all know that malware comes into effect because an app comes in and it asks for permissions and you grant the permissions and then it does something it shouldn't do with the permissions. So if an app can read your address book and access the internet, it can upload your address book to the internet. But what about malware that takes without asking? What about something that you can install on your device that asks for no permissions at all but can access your most sensitive data? Who am I and why am I here to talk about Android security? You can ignore fancy job titles. I'm an ethical hacker, so I look at Android and I work in the R&D arm of MWR Info Security. And I've been researching Android for a few years now. What we're going to cover today is, after this quick introduction, we'll have a quick look at the security model in Android and how apps commonly break that model. And then we'll introduce a tool that we've developed. It's an open source tool called Mercury that you can use to assess your application and identify whether it contains these security vulnerabilities. And then, because slides are great, but we're mostly developers here, we want to do something practical, we'll actually do an assessment live on the screen and we'll tear an Android application to pieces. So, the Android security model itself is reasonably good. Normally, when you install an app, it runs in a Dalvik Java VM that constrains your code within a sandbox, so you don't have access to the underlying hardware. You're isolated from other apps on the device, and there are very granular permissions that control what you can do. And if you want to interact with another application on the device, you have to do it through the inter-process communication mechanism. So, Google have clearly thought this through, and apps continue to break it. Commonly, we see this in five ways. We get the normal kind of coding issues where people have simply just written their code wrong, so their authorization code doesn't work. Also, Android, unlike iOS, allows you to run a lot more native code and actually access the bare metal, so you see all the normal kind of buffer overflow vulnerabilities crop back up wherever anybody does that. The SD card is a massive source of vulnerabilities that we see. A lot of people don't seem to realize that the SD card is world readable and back up the application to that device or write an application to that device before installing it, which opens massive vexes to attack. Misuse of IPC is also incredibly common and it's what we're going to focus on today. And finally, I put this up here just because it's so ridiculous. There are apps in the Google Play Store with the debug flag set, which means on the production build, you can enable a debugger and attach it, which all of these security measures go out of the window if you do that. Just don't. Check your app, clear that flag. There's no reason to have it set. And you have to explicitly set it, which is why it makes no sense at all. So, I said we were going to focus on the IPC mechanism in Android, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's where you can export activities, broadcast receivers, content providers, and services for other applications to talk to. What some people maybe haven't seen is how it works underneath, and that is a service running on the device called the binder. And when you send a message to an app, it gets sent to the binder, the binder checks your permissions and forwards this on to the other app. So, notionally, you shouldn't be able to bypass the permission checking. There's a multitude of ways that people seem to mess this up. Um, this is a very common one. Uh, you should recognize this as exporting an activity called main activity from our application. And can we have a show of hands who thinks this activity is exported and another app can see it? Okay, it, it is exported. We explicitly say exported true. What about this case? If we remove that flag, is this exported to another application? 
a, a lot of people seem to think it isn't, but the intent filter adds an explicit export. So you do tend to get a number of mistakes introduced through just not really understanding what's happening. Historically, there's been a lot of tools available to help dissect what an app is doing and understand what it is doing. You've been able to do static analysis with AAPT and decompilers like Jeb. And you've been able to do dynamic analysis with the Android debugger and custom scripts. The trouble with static analysis is that it doesn't help if the problem is a lack of understanding. If you don't know what the problem you're looking for looks like, you're not going to spot it. ADB, it's quite good for playing around and seeing what an app does, but it doesn't help you identify security issues per se. And you can identify security issues with custom scripts. It's what we started off doing when we first started experimenting with Android apps, but it's an incredibly slow process to write the script, compile the script, upload it to a device, and get the results out somehow. So we created an app called Mercury. It allows you to do dynamic analysis of applications running on an Android device. It's all dynamic, it runs on your computer, so you can rapidly change code. It doesn't require debugging to be enabled, it just uses a simple network socket. And what it actually does is it allows you to assume the role of an app running on the device and execute code on the device from your computer to see what happens. It's free and it's open source. This is where you can download it from. You can also find it if you go onto the MWR Labs webpage. So how does it work underneath? What it is, you install a small agent on your device, which is an Android app with a single permission. It's the internet permission. Ideally, we'd like it to have no permission, but we need to be able to talk to it somehow. But everything that we are able to do later in this presentation, we haven't actually asked the permission to do it. So if the user were to install our app, they, haven't, they don't know that we are able to do it. Then we have the console that we run on our PC, which is a command line environment that allows us to interact with the agent and send commands. And we've written a lot of modules in this that allow you to search for common security vulnerabilities. So, it's probably enough slides. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to perform an assessment against an Android app. So we're going to start off by identifying the attack surface. Then we're going to investigate the attack vectors. Then search for vulnerabilities in the app. And finally, exploit those and actually pull some sensitive information out of the app that we're testing. The app that we're going to test today is it's a super vulnerable Android application that we've written for demo purposes. You can download it from the same place as you can download Mercury. It's a password manager called Civ. The important thing to remember is that even though this is a demo app and the vulnerabilities in it are slightly contrived, every single one of these vulnerabilities we have observed in apps available for download from the likes of financial institutions such as banks. And even in a few cases, applications that purport to be a secure bubble around your corporate data. So let's start. In the emulator on this side, we've just got a straight install of Jelly Bean. I think it's version 4.1.2. And we have the password manager Civ installed here. So when we first launch Civ, it comes up and asks us to type in our password. My very secure password is this is my password. And once we sign in, it lists out the passwords that we've stored for other services. And if we click them, it will copy them onto the clipboard and we can place them into a web app to log in. Alongside Civ, we've installed the Mercury agent, which allows us to interact with the device. 
So we'll just start the embedded server, which will allow us to connect to it. And because we're using an emulator and connected by ADB, I just need to do a quick port forward. Now we can start the Mercury console, and it comes back and confirms that it's selected a device with an Android device ID. It's manufacturer's unknown SDK, which confirms we are talking to an emulator, and we can see that the Android version is 4.1.2. And now we can start to interact with the device. So the first thing we want to do is find our app. And as I'm sure you know, all apps on Android are referred to with a package name. So we're looking for an app called Civ. So let's So we can ask Mercury to list the installed packages and show us only those that contain the word Civ. And this comes back and we found our installed application, commwr example Civ. So now we want to perform the first step of our security assessment. We want to identify the attack surface. Ooh, that's impressive. <laughs> The way Mercury is arranged internally is we have a number of modules that we can run. So app package list was a module that knows how to talk to the package manager and retrieve a list of packages. We're now going to use app package attack surface that will inspect, an, inspect a package and show us what is exported and what we can interact with potentially from our zero permission context. So we can see that our app has three activities exported, two content providers, and two services. And yes, we have the debuggable flag set. So now we can investigate each one of these potential vectors a little bit more to see whether we could actually attack the application with it. We'll start with activities. So we're going to ask Mercury to show us information about all of the activities that it finds in a package, and we'll pass it our package. And it comes back and shows us that there's not three activities exported, it's what we expected. None of them have any permission required to access them, otherwise it would have printed that out. We've got main login activity, I think we can fairly safely assume that's what gets started when we first launch the app. There's some more interesting ones in here. So there's a password list activity. And I'd wager that that shouldn't be exported. So if we flick back to the emulator, we can see currently we're looking at the Mercury server. We can investigate this vector. So we can ask Mercury to start an activity. And now we can formulate an intent that it will pass to the start activity command. So send the component, we have to specify the package name and then the activity that we want to start. And if we flick back to the emulator, sure enough, we've been launched straight into our list of passwords. That might be useful to you if you happen to have someone's phone in your hand and want to perform an authorization bypass, but there are vulnerabilities that allow you to actually exfiltrate the data remotely. Let's look at the content providers that we were exporting. Once again, we ask Mercury for information, this time about content providers. And we can see the two content providers we expect to be exported. One is database content provider, and one is file backup provider. Interestingly, the read and write permissions on this content provider are set to null, which would imply we don't need any permission, we can do whatever we want to it. Unless we specify a path of keys, and then we need a read keys or write keys permission, which would suggest that the app developers believe that the information stored in there is particularly sensitive. We can use Mercury now to query a content provider. 
and we'll try and get those keys. So we can build a content URI given the authority and the path that we want to query. And sure enough, we get permission denial. We're not allowed to retrieve this information. Interesting side note I found in an app the other week. It was using pattern literal in exactly this way. So if we append a final slash on there, our key information comes back. So don't use pattern literal. Um, but even if that weren't the case and they'd implemented that pattern check properly, we can still get that information. Just because we don't get a path listed out in the provider information doesn't mean that that path doesn't exist within the app. So we can ask it to find URIs within this app. And it's now scanning through the executable. It extracts the dex file and then it runs a strings command on it and it tries to find content URIs that are used within the app. And we can see in the same authority as keys, there's one called passwords. So let's query that. And it comes back and it lists out all of our passwords, which probably isn't great, but at least the passwords seem to be encrypted. It's some binary data, so Mercury has base64 encoded it before printing it out to screen. The thing is, a database content provider in Android is almost certainly backed by an SQL-like database. So it's vulnerable to all the SQL injection attacks that were running around the internet 10 years ago. So let's try, specifying a project, let's try specifying a projection to that query. And we'll just send a single quote mark. Doesn't look so good. Nice feature of Android is it sends back the entire query it tried to execute when you cause an exception like that, demonstrating that indeed it did allow you to put whatever you wanted in the select portion of the query. So, it's an SQL-like database. It will have a table called SQL-like master that will tell us the whole schema. So let's select star from SQL-like master and put some two dashes to make the, all the query that should be running a comment. And it comes back and it shows us we've got a table Android metadata that's always there, a table passwords that is what we were querying, and a table key that I suspect maps to the keys content provider that we shouldn't have access to. And we can confirm that by selecting star from key. And once again, we retrieve all the information from the database that on the face of it was protected. To wrap up this section, we'll also look at services to, I, I promised that we'd completely tear this to shreds, I can also recover the passwords. So, let's ask for service info. We can see that we've got two services exported, once again, don't require any permission to talk to them. A slightly interesting one is crypto service, which I'd wager does some form of cryptography, probably encrypting and decrypting of passwords. We don't currently have the ability to dissect what that does within Mercury, but it does support pulling the APK back off of the device so you can, de so you can decompile it and read the source code. And with that in mind, we've written a bunch of custom modules that interact with, these, with this service. So if we search for modules, we can see that there's one available called example civ service decrypt. I'm not entirely sure what's part of this, so I can ask for some help and it will show me how to use this module. And it comes out and it, whoa tells us that this module exploits an example vulnerability to use Civ's crypto service to decrypt a password. And it shows us a sample usage that we pass in the key, which we recovered previously by reading the keys database table, and then the ciphertext of a password. We got some password ciphertext a while ago. I'll run the query again quickly. So 
So we're going to ask it to decrypt with this is my password and the ciphertext for the supposed Google password. It takes a second, it's quite slow encryption, and it comes back and it tells us that that password actually said password one. As I said, this is a very contrived app, but we have seen these vulnerabilities all over the place, all over the Google Play Store. In the auth authentication bypass we saw in a banking app, it was actually worse in the banking app. You could press the menu button on the, on the login screen and choose settings and it would jump you through that screen. So we're clearly not getting Android security quite right. Mercury also provides you the way to automatically find some vulnerabilities. So I knew that SQL injection was there and I did a little test to find it. It's not a very real world situation. What we do have within Mercury is a number of scanner modules that help you to find vulnerabilities. So we can ask it to scan for SQL injection. <coughs> And this will take a package, dissect it, find all of the content URIs it can find in that package and test every single one of them for SQL injection. So if we run that against Civ, it takes a couple of minutes, but it comes back and it confirms that there is injection in the projection of the password's content provider and also in the selection of it. We can also use scanners to find other classes of vulnerabilities, such as directory traversal, where a content provider is backed by the file system. And if we pass it to the same app, it will think for a minute, and it comes back and says, that file backup provider we saw earlier is vulnerable to directory traversal. Which we can confirm by trying to read a file from that content provider. and that's read the host file off the device. The host file, not so much of a problem because it's meant to be world readable. It's a kind of a requirement of Linux. But if we can read a file in the context of another app, we can read all of that app's sensitive data, which Android handily stores in a very predictable format for us. So we can read from data, data, com mwr example sieve databases database.db and it will cough up the entire sql like database to us that's been a slightly whirlwind tour i think i've gone a bit faster than i should have done um, but what we've seen is that Android applications are unfortunately riddled with security vulnerabilities. And as a community, we need to be better at testing our apps and getting rid of them. Because those vulnerabilities expose our users' most sensitive data. And if we expose that data, that exposes our business to risk. Because you don't want to be the company on the front of TechCrunch saying, oh, such and such app leaked all their users' passwords. It's just not good PR. But we do have tools available to help, and Mercury is one of them. So you can download the link once again, and you can also follow the project on Twitter. It gets updated very frequently. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel.